freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 387 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearmsauctions.com, where you set the price on guns, ammo, and accessories. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is Engage to Win, and our guest is Melanie Sturm. Melanie is the founder of Engage to Win, where she admit she, she aims to change communication for good, and also the win coach for leaders of all stripes, elected officials, poli political candidates, corporate executives, advocates, and nonprofit and movement leaders. Based on the truism that people don't care much about what you know until you, they know how much you care, Melanie teaches how to become more hearable by cultivating six powers of persuasion. Welcome to the show, Melanie. Thank you. Very nice to be here and to see you in person after knowing you for a while. So I'm excited to talk to you today. I love your, your mission to inform. Mine is sort of inform, inspire, and motivate too. So we're very much in sync. Well, and it's so needed. I feel like too often these days, more than I've ever experienced in my lifetime, we are talking at each other. And instead of trying to include the, the listener in with what we're trying to get across, and that doesn't mean we're going to win every debate, but, but we'd have a much better chance if we are using these powers of persuasion that, that you teach on. And we mentioned uh, there are six of them that you focus on. What are those? Well, I'll, let me just give a little background about how I got to them, because I like to point to Mark Twain, who said, if I had more time, I could have written something shorter. Um, and I've been at this for about 10 years, and it started when I was recruited by the editor of the Aspen Times. I live in Aspen, Colorado, and I had the prior year been um, writing point counterpoints on the uh, editorial page uh, in the run up to the 2010 midterms. Um, and he had approached me in the spring of 2011 and asked if I would help him diversify the opinion page. And I always joke, it's not because he needed a woman or a Jew. And I was really scared actually to be the scourge, to be articulating ideas that would make me an outcast. I had a kid in elementary school at the time. And so I launched this column calling it, think again, you might change your mind. I did not want to parrot talking points of any kind. And what I found is that when I approach people the right way, and it's sort of embedded now in the six powers of persuasion, that not only would people think again and often change their mind, but I wasn't perceived as a conservative. It, there was no idea uh, that, 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 that the people didn't see an ideological motive. And so I started to catalog the things that I was doing, and now they're embedded in the six powers of persuasion. And if you want, I can I can go through them very briefly. They are, um, and this is one I added actually. The first one is you are the message. And it's very much based on uh, uh, the, uh, the book called um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by, um, uh, not Stephen Covey is, is um, and now I'm blanking on who wrote the seminal I book. I am too. I'm looking, oh my at my, God. looking at my bookshelf. Uh, Dale Carnegie. Yes. So Dale Carnegie's first chapter is all about you are the message, how to um, make yourself likable and make people interested in what you have to say with nonverbal cues and by projecting positivity. And so that's essentially, it's what I call persuasion or what actually um, 
uh, other, um, Robert, um, oh, the other guy who wrote the book pre Persuasion calls Presuasion. And so he's here in Arizona, uh, Caldini or? Yes, Robert Caldini, that's it. Cialdini, Cialdini, that's it. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, um, that's the first power of persuasion. And then the second power is to start with something that will find common ground. It's sort of based on Simon Sinek's very famous TED talk, one of the most viewed ever called Start With Why. Mm -hmm. And the most compelling communicators don't tell you what they believe. They tell you why they believe what they believe. Martin Luther King had a dream um, because, and I don't have to tell you what it is because he felt that the, the way he did about his kids. Um, and so I think one of the most powerful whys is embedded in our Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. So anyway, that's one way to find a common ground. There are others that I teach. The third power of persuasion is the winning side always fights for people. And unfortunately, conservatives have a tendency to fight for things. We're fighting for the Second Amendment. We're fighting for um, the... The flag, the, uh, I actually have a, a handout that I use in my workshops uh, that where I've taken the things for which we fight and I explain how those things actually help people. Uh, so for example, the, you know, the fighting for the second amendment because uh, we want uh, citizens to be less vulnerable amid calls to defund the police, for example, especially those who live in violent neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So you're fighting for people as you are fighting for the thing that the principle that we care so much about. The fourth power of persuasion is that we can reach people from across the spectrum by appealing to both fairness and compassion. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of based on uh, what Dan had said earlier. I always tell people, if you could remember nothing else about what I teach, try to remember people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So if you can just start out by saying something like, I worry about something, it's going to lead you to talk about the people that you care about and how they're affected by the bad policies that we oppose, the bad what's and um, are helped by the good policies that we support. Um, and then the fifth one is the use of story, very compelling, very memorable. And, uh, and then the sixth one is the power of the pivot, this idea of Ronald Reagan said our 80% friend isn't our 20% foe. Mm -hmm. And so if we're in uh, that foe territory, we've got to pivot back to the 80% ground. And you can do that. I teach various um, rhetorical devices on how to do it, but one powerful one, when I'm coaching candidates is they'll say, if I, if they, if they, they ask me, if I forget what I'm supposed to say, what's the trigger to help me remember. And I always say, try to just start with, I worry, because like I said, it's going to cause you to, to talk about the people that you're worrying about and why you're worrying about them. And then you will come across as, as caring while pivoting to your persuasive argument. So that in a nutshell are the six powers of persuasion. Gosh, Are you overwhelmed so, yet? <laughs> no, it's it, that was the perfect, you know, sort of little sample platter, I think, to make us hungrier for digging deeper into each one. And I mean, could each one stand on its own or do you really need to, to stack and layer? Well, I, I think the first one, uh, uh, you are the message. It's the thing that people don't realize 60 to 90 percent of in-person communication is actually nonverbal. So you can make people like you or dislike you before you've even opened your mouth. So I think that's fundamental, especially for candidates uh, or if you're, you know, you're just having a conversation with someone and you're embedded, you're, you're, you're furrowing your eyebrows and you're shaking your finger and you're crossing your arms. People are not going to listen to you, but if you're laid back, if you if you're looking people in the eye, if you're smiling, people don't realize that when you smile, it induces other people to smile back. I tested this when I was uh, I had to be in New York City for a whole month, and I I smiled at people on the sidewalks of New York, and even New Yorkers would smile back. Um, <laughs> and, and so, and it just induces people to like you. Um, so I, I do think that is foundational. And then some of the, you know, depending on how much time you have and candidates maybe only have 30 seconds in a debate, um, you really, the, the things that I think are the most important are the, the finding the common ground, finding, saying something that will make people open their ears to you. Like, when I teach my workshop, I always tell people persuasion is 
actually not giving people facts and having them listen and understand and then agree with you because facts are uncaring and people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The way to persuade is actually to articulate what someone else is inclined to think themselves. They just didn't know it until you you expressed yourself in a hearable way. So that's why what is hearable for people from across the spectrum is anyone who is fighting for people and if you're showing fairness and compassion. So I, I, maybe it would be helpful if I give, give you an example of how to sort of combine them all. Absolutely. And, um, and uh, the, the classic one that I like to do, because uh, I can show in my workshop, which you might remember, I think I did in the one that I think you participated in, it's uh, a workshop, it's it's an exam, a, 30, a 35 minute or 40, sorry, 45 second soundbite from a debate between Karen Handel and um, her opponent, John Ossoff, who's now the Senator from Georgia. And um, it, the question was asked, do you support an increase in the minimum wage? And as usual, Democrats, they always talk about how much they care about people and it's not fair. And it's, you know, he's fighting for people who deserve a living wage. And then when she picks up, it's her turn to answer, she, actually does the opposite of finding common ground. She says, well, this is the difference between a liberal and a, a liberal and a conservative. I do not support a livable wage. That was the first thing she said, the opposite of finding the common ground. And so then after that, who's going to listen to anything else that she has to say? So when I demonstrate it, I say, um, of course, I believe in a liberal wage. And I say that because that's not the same thing as saying I support an increase in a minimum wage. It's just a common ground thing that gets makes you hearable. Of, right. It's like a giveaway. Of course, I believe in a livable wage. I just worry about the most vulnerable in our society, yeah. young minorities. And if yeah. they can't get a job at $10 an hour, how are they ever going to get a job at 15? And if they can't get their hand on the opportunity ladder, how are they ever going to climb it to a living wage? And that's not fair. And in that, you heard me, one of the other rhetorical devices of how to pivot from unfriendly ground to friendly ground is to ask questions. It's fundamental, it's very key. So you heard me, instead of making a declarative statement where I said, well, people who can't get a job at 10 will never get it at 15, that causes the backfire effect. People will find evidence to the contrary or, it, it, it will make the hair on the people's back go up. They don't, de declarative statements are not as persuasive. But if you frame it as a question, well, how can someone who can't get a job at 10 get it at 15? Then they have to own the answer. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's more persuasive. And the, the, the reason I like to use this as an example, because it does combine all of the six powers of persuasion, is because uh, every summer Business Insider does a poll and it shows that about two thirds majority, so includes a lot of Republicans, actually support increasing the minimum wage mm -hmm. until they find out who's hurt and that people, the most vulnerable, won't get jobs if the minimum wage goes up. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's how to persuade is, is to show people that people will be hurt by the bad policies. Yes. I should have met her about 20, 30 years ago, Melanie, because <laughs> I tell you, I, my communication skills are terrible. And I <laughs> I go to a lot of people's houses that maybe are on the opposite side. They're not. But why do you go to their houses? To to uh, buy their stuff, to uh, liquidate their furniture, things like that. House. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, they got their CNN news on and you can't talk to a lot of these people. And you just gave me some tools to work with. That's great. They're, and they're so easy. Yeah. You know, you think about it. They're really easy. So right. I appreciate that. And maybe I could even win a few arguments with my wife. No, that's not <laughs> no. no, it's, it's not you know, winning arguments. It's, fi it's finding the common ground. Yeah, I see all these things you said. I could check out. Yeah, that was last week. Uh, that was last <laughs> month. I mean, we don't fight, but we do have some co good conversation. She she uh, steers gets me uh, steered in the uh, right direction. I right? I engage to win. That's what I oh, do. Yeah, right? she wins. <laughs> she wins. But um, so, but engage to win. I always hasten to tell people, and I start a workshop, is that engaging to win. People think it's about winning talking points or debates or elections. Right. But it's right. not it's about winning people to the common ground they instinctively share. Yes. They just didn't know it till you brought them there. 
Yeah. All jokes aside, that's exactly right. And when you can get both people to agree without arguing and and understanding, then it, mm -hmm. it, it makes a big difference. So no, absolutely. And and just as as Dan was saying, uh, you know, when somebody needs their estate liquidated and our pot of gold estate liquidations auctions, you know, we we travel around and we go into their the privacy and the sanctity of their homes. And sometimes, you know, he'll be wearing a shirt that has our business name on it, uh, pot of gold, that's neutral, right? But we also have AZ firearms auctions. So if he's wearing that shirt or this shirt, gun freedom radio, it can cause people to feel like, okay, wait a minute. Uh, are you one of those wacky gun people? And so that's where these conversations come up. And it's not like he goes into their home and then starts wanting to lecture people. But if the conversation comes up, um, you're actually very brilliant at it. He he demurs, but he is very brilliant at it. And he puts it, it's people forward, it's relationship forward. I'm here to serve you, whatever it is. Yeah, you I'm their need. guest. I'm not And gonna... if you want to talk about this other issue, I'm game for that. But he doesn't go into it with this mindset that he's got to somehow win, win no. or change somebody's mind during that transaction or whatever. And um, but having more tools like this, I think can only be good for all of us and you well know, i want to add to that real quick mm -hmm. the i it seems like in the last four or five years it's it's been harder mm -hmm. it's, it wasn't this way before you know two people that didn't agree could talk and have helpful conversations mm -hmm. now you you can't i mean it, it's harder unless you know these tools well so my next question to you miss melanie is about the idea of that hostility that seems to just be either overt sometimes, you know, or it's just bubbling right under the surface. And I do think, you know, you mentioned the 24 hour, seven day a week news in air quotes, no matter what the station is, it's like, they're just, you know, keeping that fire stoked up that, that hostility, that division. And so if somebody is hostile to our ideas, our values, our message, uh, how, how do we move through that because I think we start getting defensive inside and then that shows on our face. It shows in our eyes. It shows in our body language. What can we do better about that? So I think it's very important to distinguish uh, the audience. So we have our friendlies. There are people predisposed to agreeing with us. We have what I call persuadables, which I think are the low hanging fruit. They are the largest plurality, if not the majority. And then you have the hostels. And it's very important to recognize that hostels, like in the candidate's case, whoever their opponent is, is by definition a hostile. You're not going to change their mind. You're not going to convert them. The best you can do is power them down. And so I always advise not even attempting to convert a hostile unless you're in the presence of persuadables. And if you do it effectively and engage to win style, then the persuadables will be drawn to you and your thoughtfulness and repelled by the hostility of the hostile. And so, you know, examples of that are to, um, uh, you know, let's take the issue of, of um, hot button issue right now, abortion. In Colorado, a lot of people don't know what the law is here. And so people are outraged all across the country by the Dobbs decision. A way to um, power down a hostile who is accusing you of wanting to take away women's reproductive rights is, uh, or that the Supreme Court, that's what the decision is, is to ask a couple questions. Um, and let's see how the persuadables react to this question. You're not going to change the mind of the hospital. You could say, well, don't you think that citizens of a democratic republic like America should have the right to make the laws that govern them? question mark. Mm -hmm. Hostel might not agree with that, but the persuadable is going to say, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of what that decision was, in fact. And then the second one, the more powerful one, is to say, well, in Colorado, do you agree with the law that says that a woman who goes into labor at nine months on the way to the hospital can make a decision as to whether or not she's going to have an abortion or have the baby? Just ask that question. Now, the persuadable is going to say, and this is happening a lot here, is like, what? Is that the law? <laughs> they don't even right. know. They don't right. even know. 
Um, the hostel who may or may not know the law, they're not going to, they'll be dumbfounded. But it's one of, I just wanted to give an example of a, of a way to power down a hostel, especially by asking questions that put them on the defensive or make them own a premise that it's hard for them to defend. Like for example, during COVID, you know, a lot of hostility over things like lockdowns and masks mm -hmm. and certainly the vaccine mandates, but just, you know, they would accuse people who they thought felt were cavalier, uh, you know, if, if you're not for the lockdowns or for the mass or whatever. And I would say, well, I worry about people who are vulnerable to COVID, to COVID as I am people who are vulnerable to COVID lockdowns. Aren't you? Mm -hmm. So you're, it's like, uh, I well forget done. who originally said it, but I think it's attributable to F. Scott Fitzgerald. He said the mark of brilliance is being able to hold two competing ideas mm -hmm. in mind at the same time and retain the ability to function. You can be concerned about people who are vulnerable to COVID and people who, the, 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 the kids who are locked out of school, who've suffered pandemic losses, who maybe the only decent meal they had was at school and they weren't getting it, whose parents couldn't go to work on Zoom and left them behind without oversight they maybe got drug addicted or, you know, you can start talking about the effects of COVID on, or the lockdown, I mean, on people and start to create a little balance between what people were inclined to at the beginning to say, we need the lockdowns to save lives. But yeah, look, 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 look at the impact that on lives that, um, that we've had because of the lockdowns to look at both sides of it. And that's a fairness appeal. That's a fairness appeal and fairness appeals, um, they work. It's all based in the um, moral foundation theory of Jonathan Haidt, who wrote the book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Differ on Politics and Religion, I think is the subtitle. And um, there are five moral foundations through which we look at society. We They're like moral taste buds. And um, I'll just give you the punchline. You could take a test on his website, yourmorals.org, and find out where you are on the spectrum of conservative to, to liberal morality. But um, conservatives care about all five about the same. And liberals are off the charts in terms of fairness and compassion. So it's the reason for which there's, there's fairness and compassion, and then purity, authority, and uh, um, purity, authority, and um, ah, what's the fifth one? Well, it's this idea that in loyalty, it's loyalty. Mm -hmm. So it's only conservatives that cared when Miley Cyrus was twerking or that movie Cuties on Netflix with the little girls playing the pole dancers, not so much liberals. It's only conservatives that cared that there were little kids crossing the border un unaccompanied where the you know liberals were concerned about those kids and, and had compassion for them. Um, and it's only conservatives that cared that Barack Obama didn't wear a flag on his lapel in 2008, where liberals could have cared less. So that's why, the, you know, when we go for patriotism arguments, we're only going to appeal to conservatism. Or if we're making money arguments, we that's not even morally salient. We can't we can't appeal to anyone. But if you make a, a money argument in terms of fairness and compassion, you can reach everyone. So for example, say something like, um, you know, why would we be spending so much money on diversity, equity, and inclusion programming in schools um, when children are not performing uh, academically and we need to channel that money into the schools so that they're not left behind? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, instead of railing against unsustainable entitlements to say it's unfair that people paying into the system now won't get their benefits when they retire. That's a money argument made as a fairness appeal. And so that's the sweet spot when that's how, that's why it works. So any argument that we wanna make, we can um, make as a fairness appeal. It's unfair that people here illegally have their interests put before everyone else. Mm. It's uh, the, the NATO countries must pay their fair share. Um, the one-sided Iran deal is unfair. You say something like that out of the box, it's going to be difficult for a, a, a hostile to oppose you and you will appeal to persuadables. Our elections should be, make sure our election system should make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. Mm -hmm. That's an example of, all of those are examples of common ground and they are common ground because they're framed as, as uh, in a fairness frame. Absolutely. Um, 
my mind is just a buzz with uh, things that, you know, examples that I want to pull in and, and like break them down with you. But um, I think I'll take a broader scope and say, you know, we, we always talk about, you know, the great divides, right? So right now there's conservative ideas, there's conservative values, there's conservative, and, and even the fact that we're labeling them in that way might be a little bit, um, maybe a little arrogant. I'm not sure, but you know, we do tend to want to categorize things. So let's say we have, you know, the, the conservative, um, the spectrum along the spectrum, there's people that lean more to these conservative things. The other side, it feels like the their own label keeps shifting, right? So it was um, pretty much Democrat. It was Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. Well, then it was like, well, no, progressive or liberal progressive. And now the term that I'm seeing most often even by people who are on that part of the spectrum is Marxist, communist, socialist, Marxist. And where that was a like a dirty word growing up when I was younger, because we were closer to, you know, what what went on during World War II and, and what Marxism stood for and, you know, was was on display for the world. Now it seems like there's this badge of, of honor for it. So when you're so far uh divided and i i understand the idea of most people are still in that middle space that's what our show is even designed to do is to speak to people who are you know not pegged out in one one area or the other but when <laughs> this is so hard to ask because i i know where my mind spends most of our time my it's time and and where my values are and it definitely is leaning towards the conservative side and so I would say that conservative values and ideas and politics and laws help people where historically, right? But then I've got to go up to my brain. I'm, I've lost a bunch of people because I'm not being emotional. Historically speaking, Marxist ideas and politics and values have been disastrous for individuals, for societies. How, how is it that we are standing here right now and conservatives are the one at the top of the terrorist list <laughs> with the FBI? I guess that's where I'm going with my wow, question. You've got some issues, Cheryl. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like that was a long way around the block, yes. but I think that's where I'm going. Like how did, how is it so yeah. confused, I guess, or is it confused? Am I just, are you biased? saying how to say a good thing about Marxists or communism? Huh? How do you say a good thing about that to, to kind of, to kind of get the conversation going? I don't know, maybe. This is Melanie. Well, Tom right. Soul actually, I thought, put it really well when he said he, he was referring to socialism, but it could be Marxism, uh, it could be statism, any bad idea. That's why I, I when I saw this quote, I, I, I it struck me as um, very powerful because I've always taught that, the, that our values and principles uh, are the best and policies are the best for the most people, especially the most vulnerable. Mm. And their, however you want to characterize them, their ideas and values and principles actually devastate the very people they purport to help. And yet they're the kind hearted and we're the black hearted. They get to coast above the wreckage of their policies on their benign intentions. And that's the whole premise of my workshop is why is that is we can point the the finger and say it's the fault of the media and late night comics and Hollywood and social media. But I point the thumb and say, what we've got here is failure to communicate. And that's what, that's why I'm a communications coach now that's a, or a persuasion coach. And so back to what Tom Sowell said, even he was referring to socialism. He said, the best argument for socialism is it sounds so good. The best argument against it is it doesn't work. And so that's why I teach that we have to take whatever the idea is that doesn't work mm -hmm. and fight for the people who are hurt by that bad idea. You know, the, these climate change or the Green New Deal ideas sound great to people uh, until they realize that it's going to artificially increase the price. Let's look what's happening right now. We are experiencing 
an increase, not only in the price of energy, but as a consequence, everything else in the economy is going up. And so people are literally having to make choices between can they um, put food on the uh, protein on the plate for their families or fill their car up with gas or heat their home or in, air, in Arizona, air condition their home. Um, and that's not fair. And so when you start to talk about, well, shouldn't we look at the pros and cons of all energy alternatives in order to derive the optimal solution for the environment and human flourishing? You ask it as a question, a hostile is not going to agree with us, but a persuadable would be like, actually, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. um, should we be uh, essentially uh, under, under investing in a, and shutting down America's energy industry at a moment when uh, much of the world is dependent on Russian energy, we're literally fueling their Russian aggression mm -hmm. while we're undermining ourselves at home, creating inflation and hurting ourselves. Why would we do that? Mm -hmm. So this again is looking at policies that um, sound good to people mm -hmm. as Tom Sowell says, but we have to demonstrate how they don't work and they hurt people. That's the most important thing. They hurt people and they're not fair and they're certainly not compassionate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can I answer your question? I mean, the one thing mm -hmm. I also want to say about Marxism using that word, I get what you're saying. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I like to point out um, when I talk about how to persuade it, and not to come out with a declarative statement because that will cause the backfire effect. And people, because of confirmation bias and motivated reasoning, they will find reasons to deny whatever facts you're telling them. So, and, and then dig in deeper. So for example, the day after George Floyd died or was murdered, um, people put Black Lives Matter signs in their storefronts and their yards. And in, you could have taken what was on the Black Lives Matter website as fact and gone to tell them that Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization. It wants to defund the police. It wants to dismantle the American family. And that would, that transmission of facts would have caused the backfire effect because they would say, well, I'm not a Marxist and I don't want to defund the police or dismantle the American family. So the only way you could possibly persuade them is to ask them a question that helps them, un um, that helps separate them from this belief by showing them that their belief actually hurts the people they most want to help. That's the only way to separate people from these bad ideas. And you have to do it with language that doesn't cause the backfire effect. So I wouldn't call it Marxist. I would say, well, don't you worry about this organization's, um, uh, uh, this organization's belief in, um, um, in defunding the police thereby making those who are most vulnerable to violence more susceptible to it. Aren't you worried about their public safety? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have to, that that thereby causes them to check their premise or they, they probably didn't know it. So you're exposing them to something that they didn't know in a more gentle way in the form of a question rather than telling something that could cause the backfire effect. And so the, the last point I wanna make here is that different words, words mean different things to different people. So I'm very careful not to use labels. Mm -hmm. Conservative in this context, we're conservatives is good, but. Uh, to go out and say, uh, for example, when Karen Handel said this is the difference between a liberal and a conservative, she was turning off all liberals yeah. who later, according to the polls, show that they actually, when they realize that minorities are hurt by increasing the minimum wage, they agree with not doing it. So you don't want to turn off the people by using labels. And so I always say, define what you mean. The, the conservatives on the school board that were being recalled in Jefferson County, the Denver Post called them the conservative bloc. I called them education reformers because that's what they are. Mm -hmm. And I want even liberals to consider that that's, that, that, that I don't want them to turn off to them by using a label that, um, that would make them less inclined to open their ears. And the, so, the opponents of the conservative bloc, they weren't the teachers, they're the education establishment because they want to keep things the way they are. No, very, very well said. And so because my main lane is, you know, the Second Amendment, gun rights, uh, that sort of thing, I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm putting it in that frame. 
And so just even, uh, you know, we, in our world and in our language, we try the best we can to stop saying pro gun and anti gun, because it's really not about the tool necessarily, right? It's pro rights or anti rights. It's pro individual liberty and anti individual liberty, these kinds of things. Um, but but then you have to hope that your audience values rights, right? Because if you're pro or anti rights, then if they don't value rights or understand rights, then your argument's going to wash away. Um, and so pro individual safety, pro self-defense, like we're trying to find sort of a, a statement that, that touches everyone. And one thing that I try to, to say when I'm trying to reach a broader audience is we all want to protect what we love, right? That's a, that's a given. And, you know, for us having the right, the rights to the right tools, the ability to have the right tools. And, and so I kind of try to go down that lane. Um, but when you say that you use the, the whole, um, you know, defunding the police, um, dismantling the family that actually hurts the most vulnerable. So with, with gun rights, it's the same thing. So there's people sitting in their lofty seats saying, you know, well, we, we do want to do away with all guns. That's, that's kind of the point of what we're doing. Well, at least we're to the place of honesty after all these years. No, we don't want to take your guns. Well, now they're saying it. So we're trying to help people understand that lack of access or limited access to whatever tool of safety and self-defense that fits your life and your needs the best, that is only going to, to result in more harm uh, not only to yourself personally, but to your, your neighborhood, it's, it's a little harder because there's been this huge campaign to make the tool a scary thing. And instead of people understanding that, you know, two and a half million times every year, lives are saved by responsibly armed people. Like they don't even know that piece of it. And so sometimes it's compelling to share that, but other times people are so locked in no guns are bad. And if you own those things, then you're bad as well. That it just is becoming, I think, harder to, to have a reasonable, persuasive conversation about that particular thing. Do you have any thoughts on that specifically? Or yeah. is it always just going to be a broad, you know, umbrella of using the persuasive tools? Right. So uh, on the on the issue of the Second Amendment and guns, it's it's very difficult because, and I, I'll just sort of cut to the chase. What I think is one of, and I it's something that I, I can't say I have the answer now. I I told you once before I'd love to noodle on this and try to figure out and study it and try to figure out in a concise way the best uh, the mess best messaging on it. But I think that that when we look at these tragedies in Uvalde and some of the schools, Columbine here, that it outrages people. It's really hard for people to understand why and how young people could get access to guns and do such violence. Um, and yet they don't look at what's going on in Chicago or you know, some of the other places around the country where crime is at epidemic levels. In Colorado, we are suffering a huge surge in crime. And um, it says it isn't as much um, murder with guns, but there's a lot of death because we essentially decriminalize fentanyl. So I think at this, you can be concerned about gun violence, but shouldn't we also be concerned about not enforcing the laws that are uh, letting people, Colorado's become, become the drug dealer capital of the world. Children are dying mm -hmm. because they have, in two cases in the last year, put their hand on a dresser where there was fentanyl and then put it close to their mouth and, and then overdosed on it. Oh, yeah. um, and, but we were not looking at that. And so I think that the, 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 the way to, I, I do think that the self-defense, the self-defense argument is very important that we are, uh, uh, that people are entitled to defend themselves, especially in, in, in violent neighborhoods and, um, I do think that 
enforcing the law, equality under the law uh, is a very important argument that we should be making. Um, and um, uh, I think beyond that, um, you know, just record, trying to help people understand that it's not either or. It's we that that when we enforce the laws equally, we keep people in jail who deserve to be there. We have prosecutors who are who are put in a position to prosecute people and put them in jail when they've committed heinous crimes. They should stay there. A lot of the gu gun violence that we have in this country is because we're not prosecuting people and we're letting them out on on the street when they should be. Uh, incarcerated. Um, but people only look at the these aberrant stories, the story, for example, of the, you know, Uvalde, of the kid who bought the guns legally and then just create, did a heinous crime. Uh, I think we also need better policing. We need to train policing better. So it's like not a, it's not a uh, an easy uh, messaging argument, but I do think bringing people back to the idea that what is what has happened in societies that have gone totalitarian? You know, I happen to be Jewish. I know that in Nazi Germany, the first thing they did was take away possession of guns and its fundamental right to protect yourself that we shouldn't dismiss out of hand. People should be very thoughtful about that. Um, and uh, so I guess, you know, I'd beyond that, I think uh, I'd have to really do some homework to under to so many of these other issues are easier for me to address. Even abortion mm -hmm. now is, it used to be hard for me, but now I feel like I've kind of noodled on that for a while. The gun issue, um, again, comes back to, I, I wouldn't just make it about rights. I would make it about why do rights make our society freer and fairer? And, and, and we should be very circumspect before we give up any rights. Rights are given to us by God. They're natural to us. We are uh, we, we possess them. No single king, d dictator, president, aristocrat, mayor, police chief gives us our rights. Nor can they ever take them away. And so we have to be very careful when when we when we uh, talk about that. At the same time, we don't let people own Uzis. So, like I said before, we have to be able to have two competing ideas in our head at the same time and retain the ability to function. We should be able to legislate and control or regulate the possession of some kinds of weapons while allowing others and then enforcing the law equally and not letting people possess guns. And then the last argument is this whole argument of, you know, it's an economic argument. When you, as we did in prohibition, uh, outlaw something, then you create black markets for it and you create, or with drugs as we have now, and you create incentives for more crime when you have outlawed it. And uh, that causes its own ripple effect. So I know I, I know I just did a stream of consciousness here. I wasn't as prepared to answer the, the gun question as I was some of the others, but sure. um, I think you see where my mind goes. It's just trying to help people understand the later consequences of making decisions. Again, what, what, how are people hurt by making a bad decision? Yeah. Uh, and Melanie, you, you hit it on the nail. In the yes. first five, something, first, I threw something no, at the, I threw everything at the wall, and something no, stuck. The first five, the, the first five words you said, I'd have to study on it. Yeah. Okay. And then at the end, you closed with more research. Yeah. The problem is that a lot of people that I meet. They're glued to the TV. Mm -hmm. They hear what somebody says. And so therefore that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And studying on it, like I can see, I think I assume that you're not really up on the gun rights deal, all of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, so I'm aware, I, I'm aware of, of, of the issues. I've just not um, worked on the messaging. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a, again, it's a studying on it. If I, it's if that I want to, willingness and that right. openness, I think that's where he's going. Is right. That there's too many people that no one does it. They just, they, they somebody tells them something way through. Right. And, somebody yeah. tells them something and that's the way it is. Right. And so I, I appreciate that because by studying it could open your own mind to certain things. Like, so it helps to, you know, if you want to talk about gun control, study on it. Find the effects on it since 1934. Mm -hmm. Think about what happened to all the, the Jews in Germany. Yeah. 
you think about all these things and it makes you think, well, you know what, maybe guns are good for, you know, it's just things to think about, but Absolutely. studying, that's the key. Absolutely. Well, we well I are... also like to study the polling on it. And I actually haven't seen a whole lot of polling to be quite honest on how Americans, um, view the second amendment and gun rights and i do think like on abortion we know that actually people do believe in a lot of restrictions on abortion they don't want to outlaw it altogether but they want just like in europe they settled on a policy that's a first trimester and so i think you know that's that um I'd like to know the best messaging is based on what we know about what people already believe, because that's what persuasion is, is pulling out of people's heads what they already believe. And my inclination is Americans do believe in the Second Amendment and that we have a, a good basis of making an argument in support of it. And that would resonate. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And you know, one of the hard things is a poll is only as good as the uh, bias confirmation it is trying to reach, right? right? Phrased, right. Confirmation bias. And um, the other thing is, you know, I and I do think that, that we would use it as a finding a middle ground, but, you know, the idea that, well, we've already outlawed Uzis and that's good, right? And I would say, why? Why is that good? I Maybe it's good. Maybe it's they not good. Out, because they didn't outlaw them. I had two. Right. Well, we had the right kind of licensing that we could have, we could own anything, but you know, you go back to what happened in Germany and if, if an Uzi was the best and most effective self-defense tool, then why not have it? Right. If you're a safe, how do you keep moral, Uzi trained hands, person. How do you keep Uzis out of the hands of a school shooter? Well, you started it. You, you started the conversation with, anything you know, it, the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm 60 something years old. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I, I can't count anymore, <laughs> but I went to school, high school with a gun in my truck, hanging on the back of the door on the rack. As did most. And yeah. we were taught it. We, we've lost something, yeah. Melanie, we've lost it. And, and, and we've got to find that thing. because it's, it's, it's not the tool. It's, it's not the tool. Thing. We, we used to go yeah. shooting after school teachers would go with us and if we got in a fight at school which we all got in fights at school we didn't think about guns right you know we just used our fists and we moved on right. but, but we are where we are and right. now what do we do about it right but we are so out of time we have got to have you back yes. on we've got to unpack this a little more and just even this where you and i are are sort of like we would love to debate that the uzi question i would like to know how we could do that more effectively so that we're not polarized right. but we're finding a place where we go oh i heard you i value what you say your opinion your knowledge and then i feel the same that right there would be a huge improvement to where we are across the nation right now right, right? no winners just just comment comments just i you know it goes to social media i call it um that we we live in these thought silos that are fed by what i call curated tribalism of social media you only follow people who confirm your bias and unfriend those who don't and that's where a lot of these kids who are very sick uh, they're living in these thought silos and they that's okay. what prompts them to act the way they do so i think it's okay. it's a cause that we, we should really focus on and not so much the tool as you call it, Cheryl. I it's agree with that. Gun. It's the impulse of the of the, these people to do ill, to 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 make violence. Why are they mm. doing that? But there's people said. that would have Perfectly a conversation said. with that too. So yeah. I mean, but that's another good conversation. Yeah. This is we should, amazing. We should we have her on, yeah. Then I mean you say your seminars are like what three hours long or all day long. So this well, is well the ones that I'm doing now on education that I think you participated in, they're mm -hmm. two hours. I can I have condensed it in as little as an hour. I'm sort of talking the way I, I have a, a a presentation that I can do in as little as an hour. And when you ask about like where do people find me? I've I've got to build a page on my website because I'm starting to do more Zoom workshops, which makes them accessible um, to where people, wherever they are. I do in person, and which is always better. But the Zoom workshops I do on uh, conservative persuasion. I do it on how to talk about education issues, particularly these sticky ones about you know critical race theory and gender ideology. I've been developing messaging on how to talk about that. I do a civil discourse workshop that's not political. It's focused on 
um, encouraging, especially young people and um, and on college uh, campuses. Uh, to engage with one another because vast majorities in this country and especially on college campus are self-censoring out of fear of reputational yeah. consequences. Yeah. So I teach, you know, this idea uh, the, of John Stuart Mill, which is that he who only knows his argument doesn't know it, that you have to have, you have to hash things out with other people to really know what your own argument is. And so I teach a civil discourse workshop. I also am going to be doing more of those on Zoom. Um, and then I also teach an Israel workshop on how to talk about Israel. So I've got to build a, a part of my site. I have two sites. I'll just tell you, um, engage to win.org. And the two is not spelled T O it's just the number two engage to win.org. And people can contact me through the website. Um, and then the other, uh, website is the And there I have more, uh, I mean, that's where I'm going to build, uh, uh, where I'm going to be conducting my workshops and um, and the schedule for my Zoom workshops as well. Very good. Awesome. Thank you so much. You are such a busy person and thankfully you're busy because people are hungry for this information and uh, you've given us so much of your time today. I so Thanks value that. Thanks for helping spread and disseminate it because I, one of the things I want people to know is that you know, we all want to make this world better and we're all concerned and we shouldn't self-censor. And when we speak up and speak the right way, we won't be self-censored. We will be viewed as thoughtful and compassionate and fair. And that's really, I want, if I can just end with that, to just say thank you for helping empower people uh, to use their God-given voices to make the world a better place. That's what that's that's what the American idea is based on, hashing things out to form a more perfect union, as Abraham Lincoln talked. Um, so thank you for inviting me on and helping disseminate uh, what I do. Thank you awesome. so much. We will definitely be in touch in the future. Thanks, right. Melanie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You know, that's the key right there, mm -hmm. making it where hearable, mm -hmm. you know, where we are, where we can be heard mm -hmm. and not 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 like a, a a parent to their kid right but to to communicate in a way that you're caring about the other person's thoughts and process because they do have feelings too absolutely and i i think we vilify each other far too much like well you're like that not just the idea maybe is is wrong or bad or evil but the person right has become you know evil the, the way we view each other and we've got to We've got to be the example to to be sure we're not going over that line. Our show, and we are over the line yeah. of time. So we have to. You have to. You have to be quiet now. I do. Oh, dang it! All right. I love to hear your voice, though, and I just want you to know it's time to be quiet and just say goodbye. <laughs> We need to pray and we need to, to how, how do people find us, Cheryl? I love that question, honey. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you to our amazing guest, Melanie Sturm. Thank you to our amazing, awesome listeners all over the globe, wherever there is internet, we have listeners. We value you. Thank you so much for taking these ideas from our ex uh, subject matter experts into your world, around your dinner right. tables, in your carpools. Thank you for all that you do uh, to help um, take this message more from just a conversation that we would love to have anyway, right? Dan and I and our guests and, and help expound it into um, change in our world. It's beautiful. Thank you. And if you want to watch this episode on video uh, or any of our episodes, go to the YouTube channel, GunStreamer or the Opslin smartphone app. Be sure you subscribe and hit notifications uh, so you're aware of all the new content coming up. If you like the audio only version, because you're out for a long Sunday drive or, you know, something like that, mowing the yard, cleaning the house, then go to Gun freedomradio.com click the on demand tab and binge listens to your heart's content darling oh you do that beautifully all right and then if you want to see photos and bios of all of the guests we've ever had on click the guest tab it is a tremendous and always growing resource and when you spend time there we don't hate that all right until next time we are going to pray, pray for, for our this nation. nation Ooh, we did that in unison pray, pray for, for our, our leaders, leaders even the ones you don't even the one, even, even the ones, ones you, you don't, don't like, like, especially, especially the ones, ones you don't, don't like. like.
All right. Well, be good to each other. Have a great week. And God bless. Bye-bye.